Whenever we read the accounts of um, Jesus being born, most people think of the accounts that are found in the Gospels, you know? Um, and we usually see Jesus as this little baby that came to earth, you know? He is so fragile. And we also get to see the side where he suffers and he's, you know, the sacrifice for us. But rarely do people ponder on the fact that he was not just the sacrifice, he was not just the lamb, but he is also the Lion of Judah. And, you know, as we see everything that's developing nowadays, as we see how events are fulfilling, and we know that the Lord is soon to return, we are to ponder also on the fact that he's a just God. He has the power for so many things. He's not just the lamb, but he's also the lion of Judah. And I hope that as we sing this song, we might ponder on his glory and what he has done for us and his power. Messiah would come, the earth will rejoice, the people start to sing. For they would behold, as scripture foretold, a mighty king of kings. But he came as a child, not like they had planned, not like they planned. Lion of Judah. Thank you for blessing us this evening and encouraging us to worship the Lion of Judah. What a song. 
Thank you, thank you. How are you all doing this evening? One week for the academy, first week down. How many to go? Nobody's counting? (laughs) Forty-some? I don't know what it is either. I haven't counted it up, but... uh, (laughs) Um, 180 days minus five. <clears throat> um, anyway, and the college down several weeks, three now. Um, congratulations, you've made it uh, one one hundredth of the way through the school year, or whatever it is. <laughs> um, I was blessed this morning uh, as I they had the memorial service for Mircha Dragomir, and uh, it was streamed live, and so I was able to tune in a little bit on it. I was teaching during the first part of it. I had forgotten, I think although although I had encountered it before, that he had, uh, in Romania, before he had come here to the United States, during communism, had been imprisoned for his faith for five years, and had been suffered, beaten, and had been quite um, cruelly treated there in in prison. And um, he was, they, um, they asked uh, David Machado, his son-in-law, preached the sermon for it. <laughs> Made it through. It was amazing. Um, at one point, though, he told the story. He said that someone asked him, while you were in prison all those years, did you ever cry or did you ever think about crying? He said, no, I never did. Well, actually, once I did because there was another man whose life was all messed up by sin and, it was so, and he didn't know the God that I knew and I felt so bad for him that I... I almost cried. A godly man who um, touched many lives. And I do, do want you to continue to pray for the family, for Abby and, and uh, Valentina's wife and the others, and uh, the, those there at the, sco- at the institution that are all affected by the loss of one of their dearly beloved teachers and um, workers there. So let's continue to remember um, their family. Yes. Yes, our Abby, is, Abby was the girl's dean for a while in the academy. She was a student in the academy. My wife was her dean in the academy for a while. And then she was a college student, and she was a staff here at Washita Hills. And she met her husband here, who was a college student at Washita Hills. Well, they didn't, I mean, they, they, they dated afterwards. They were both in the college at the time. Well, no, they weren't in the college. <laughs> she was staff. They met here, but then eventually they got, they got together and married after they'd graduated. And so both the family and uh, they've been intimately connected. They're part of us. And so we, we, we grieve with them. And um, our hearts certainly go out to them. Well, I tonight want to talk about something that is not, I mean, it is, it is related to salvation, but it's not specifically, I'm not specifically talking about how we, are being, how we are saved, and I don't want you to get confused, because sometimes when you come to a place like this, and there's a lot of different things, standards, and things that we uphold and we are trying to do, it's easy to confuse those as what you have to do to be saved, and if you don't do them, it's easy to think, well, I, I can't be saved, or whatever. And granted, there's a relationship between them, but we have to make sure that we understand that our salvation is not necessarily formed by a list of do's and don'ts. Do you understand that? And that you can do all the right things and be lost, and you can do sometimes the wrong things and be saved, although God is leading you and guiding you in a path of salvation, we understand. But we, are, we, are, we know that salvation is by faith alone. It is through grace, by faith, alone in the merits of our wonderful Savior that you and I have who came down here. And he wasn't just our, he, was, he is our Savior because of what he was initially. What was Jesus before he was our Savior? He was our creator. From the very beginning of time, God used somehow, we don't understand the, the, the Godhead, but God used Jesus, or through Jesus, the Bible records that God created the worlds 
that through Jesus, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and then it says, all things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In verse 3. Through Jesus, everything that we have is made, and He is our Creator. And what a wonderful thing that we have this loving God that created us. Now, why did God create us? I mean, he was in eternal relationship as the Godhead with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they had this companionship, at least as far as we understand, it's a mystery to a large degree, but forever. We can understand that. But they had this companionship. Did he need more? Did he have to create more to be satisfied and fulfilled? Well, we don't know. But somewhere in the mind of God, because of his nature, because of who he is, he created, right? The angels first, and then there was going to be this new world. And it was going to be a unique world because those created human beings were going to have a capacity like none others as far as we know in, in the universe. This power of procreation, of creating a life again, uh, through continuing on in the earth. And God created man in his own what? Image. That means you and I have this reflection of God, even though it's marred by sin and we mess up that image. It is still there. And you have this loving God that he created you. And then after we sinned, he came and he looked and he said, I'm not satisfied. I'm not, my heart is lonely because my children are down there that I created. And so because out of his great love, he came here for us to die for us because he wasn't satisfied to be in heaven without us. And that's the God we serve. And his salvation that he offers us is received by faith in Christ and that's the beginning of our walk with the Lord. Without that experience, the rest of what I'm going to sort of talk about is missing. There's a missing component. And so I wanted to lay the foundation and set that aside, that this is the foundation that we have to come to our Creator and our Redeemer and in faith accept what He's done in order to really be benefited by some of the information that I'm going to share after this. He created us a wonderful, loving Savior, and he came to be our redeemer. That's what Colossians, uh, John 1 and 1 and Colossians 1 16, Jesus created the world. Now, this statement in the spirit of prophecy really encourages me and it, uh, it, it inspires me in some ways. And it says this, there are great laws that govern the world of nature. Is that true? Can you name some? Gravity, that's the first one that comes to our mind. <laughs> we are all sitting here because of gravity. What other laws are there in nature? Inertia, thermodynamics. thermodynamics. Ooh, we're getting physics in here. What else? Entropy. Entropy. I mean, we could go on and on. We could list all the laws. The entire universe is based on law. If there wasn't law that was absolute and certain, our lives would be chaos. Now, sometimes they're chaotic enough because we are that uncertain element. <laughs> are we not? The only problem is our hearts are not governed by law because we have the power of choice, but all of the universe, all of the plants and animals, everything is governed by law, and if there wasn't law, our world would shiver to pieces. Everything, everything is based on law in the, in the world of nature, but it goes on and it says spiritual things are controlled by principles, what? Equally certain. Now, this to me is a powerful statement because it is saying that just like there is gravity and just like there is Boyle's law and the chemical laws and the components that you can do an experiment on and you could come up with certain results and determine those laws and they're unvarying. In the spiritual realm, there are laws equally certain that you can do experiments on and you can... You can you can put them to the test and you'll get the result. And that's a good news because sometimes in our Christian walk, we might say, oh, that is for Mr. Neal or that's for Mrs. Clark or, <laughs> and we can name, our, that, that's, that, that works for them, spiritual life, it just doesn't work for me. But if it is true, that gravity is, is effective for everybody. 
would not the spiritual laws be the same for everybody? They're equally certain. And if we apply them, we can also receive the benefit that the laws involve. And it says the means for an end must be employed if the desired results are to be attained. In other words, if you want the end result, you have to choose the right law to apply and you'll get the end result. Now that is not saying regarding salvation. Remember I told you this is not talking about salvation because salvation is by faith through grace, by grace through faith, which means that when it comes to salvation, we need this miracle experience. It's a change of heart and we can't, you can't, you can't apply a law. You can't work your way to have that happen. It's a miraculous thing that comes, although what I'm going to talk about is very closely related to how that happens in our life, okay? I want to go over a law tonight that God has created. Your loving creator has created you and I with this law in us. And there's lots of laws that you could explain and look, and that's a wonderful study to do. Try to look at spiritual laws because if you can understand the law, for instance, you go into physics or you go into chemistry and you study Boyle's law. And when you do the experiment, you know what to do because you know what the law is and you can use that law to get certain results, right? And the same thing is true with our spiritual lives. So once you learn the law, you can say, oh, now I know what it is so I can do certain things. I can follow this because God has created me this way. It's not, a, it's not my doing. It's his law, by the way. He's the one that's created it. So it's not self-righteousness because he's the one that created it. And he's the one that made it. And we get what he gave us because he made us that way. Does that make sense? It's from God and it's God's result in our lives because of what is God has done in creating us. It's not salvation by works. <laughs> we have to trust in God and follow his plan, though, to get the same results. But that comes, okay, so when we get to the end, I think you'll see maybe how that is related to salvation and coming to Christ, the law I want to talk about tonight, okay? And this is a law of the mind. Now, um, a law of the mind that I want to talk about, because our minds, sometimes we have this rather nebulous thought of our minds, because, well, you know, psychology... <laughs> Well, there's a lot of psychology out there that deals with things about the mind, but, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of thoughts, a lot of different ideas, conflicting eyes, ideas about the mind. And you can, study, you can study a lot of things in chemistry and physics, but when you get to the mind, it's kind of nebulous. But according to the spirit of prophecy, there is a law or many laws of the mind that we can employ in our own lives and we can understand. Now, in the context of this statement that I was going to share with you, is the, it's actually written to parents. And since I'm a parent, I'm interested in the law of the mind as a parent. <laughs> it's helpful in, for me in parenting. But I realized as I studied it that it's really helpful to all of us because the principle of the law of the mind, can, I can apply to myself and I can apply to the school and we can apply to each other and it'll have the same results because it is a law of the mind, right? And so if we learn it and can use it, we can get the same results. Now, it was re referring to parents, and this is what it said. Great harm is done by a lack of firmness and decision. I have known parents to say, you cannot have this or that, and then relent, thinking they may be too strict. Yeah, have you ever had that happen? I have, as a parent, have done the same thing. So <laughs> I get on my, I'll, I'll, I'll tell Elliot, Elliot, no, you can't have that. And then I feel, oh, man, that was pretty, that was, that was, that was passionate. <laughs> I said that in the moment of the frustration at his disobedience, right? And, I, and then I think, oh, I shouldn't, that was too strict. All right, you know, I did something, I put, and I've, I feel that because I'm human, and so I make mistakes even as I'm parenting, and I sometimes feel that way. And then I give the, they give the child the very thing that they first refuse. She says, a lifelong injury is thus inflicted. If a parent says, no, you can't have that, and then relents and gives it to them, they are creating in the child a lifelong injury. Whew. How long can that last? That something in that experience can create in the heart of a child something that is detrimental to them for their entire lives. This kind of command and then change the command. Got it? Okay, so we're getting to understand the law of the mind, and this is the context of it, we're referring to parents. 
Okay, so then it goes on to say, it is an important law of the mind, one which should not be overlooked, that. Okay, what do you think she might say? Anyone know? Now, maybe some of you know from reading it. So she says, in this context, it's an important law of the mind, that, which, which we should not be overlooked. It's an important one. I mean, if, you're, if, if, if inspiration tells you it's important, do you think it is? <laughs> I hope so. Right? It should be. Okay, it's an important law of the mind that, here it is, when a desired object, something that the child wants, is so firmly denied as to remove all hope, the mind soon ceases to long for it and will be occupied with other pursuits. <laughs> okay, now I may break this down for you because it says it's a, it's a law of the mind. The parent says no. And what do the children do? They really want it. It happens at our house. And it's a problem with parenting. Because when they want it and they keep pleading for it, they haven't yet arrived at the law of the mind. When they finally come to the decision that they're not going to get it and they can't get it, and there's all possibility of, it, of getting it, of a hope for it, is gone, they quit asking for it, and suddenly they're happy. Until that point... They're miserable. They're begging, they're pleading, they keep asking because they haven't yet been convinced that they can't have it. But when I finally say, Elliot, I said no. <laughs> now, it should have been the first time. It's my fault because hey, mate, I, I shouldn't have. Uh, if, there is, if they think, if I've changed before, this is the thing, if before I've said no and then I changed and given it, what have I just done to them? I've created in them this thought that they can do it again. And so they will keep asking and asking and asking because last time I changed. And if they keep asking, maybe I'll change again. And that's why there's this lifelong injury because they can't ever be certain if what is prohibited is really prohibited or not. And it goes into all of our lives because in other areas, you can't really be certain if the law is really that way or not. And we have this character that we develop in us that we're always trying to evade what people tell us we shouldn't do. Does that make sense? Okay, and then it says, but as long as there is any hope, uh, it, uh, but as long as there is any hope of gaining the desired object, an effort will be made to obtain it, and a denial will arouse the what? The worst passions. If they have a hope that they can get it, and you keep denying them, it makes them rebellious on the inside. It, it, it makes the worst passions in there. Now, that's a rebuke to me as a parent because I have to be consistent. I have to be loving but firm. And when I say one thing, not change because I could inflict upon my child lifelong injury because it's a law of the mind. That makes sense? Now, to me, it's an interesting thought because this is a law of the mind that not as a parent that I can apply, but as each one of us that we could apply. And we could, have, uh, we could, we could use this mind, in our, this law in our own experience because our minds have limited capacity um, to experience uh, everything at once. I, um, I've, I've experienced some of this in my own life, and this is how I think maybe it, it applied to me anyway, as I looked at it, I thought, you know, it's true, because it's not, I've, ha I've experienced it in my own life, and one of the things is this. Now, this isn't, I'm not holding this up as an example for everybody. We do it, we don't do it here. And, and it was more of a health thing for me. And, and, I, and so I'm not stating this as anything as, as necessarily um, something you have to do, right? But for me, I like to eat. <laughs> you wouldn't know it, I'm this, I was this way. So. But I like to eat. <laughs> and I eat, and I grew up eating three meals, but... I found it hard to eat a third meal because I like to eat. And so when I would eat a third meal, I would, it, would, it wouldn't sit well with me. And then I would, and I, and I started, I was eating two meals a day. I mean, three meals a day. And then I finally started eating two meals a day. But it was, it's really hard in some ways to skip the third meal because that's the time when everybody's enjoying time and they're, they're eating around the table and, there's, and it's hard. And so I was so tempted to eat that third meal. And I decided, you know, I really shouldn't eat it because it just, I would rather, I feel better on two meals a day. 
and I decided I wasn't going to eat that third meal. But every time I went in there, I was, oh, so tempted to eat. And occasionally I would eat. Ugh, and I would regret it. But I'd go in the next time, and oh, it looks so good, and everybody was eating, it was so fun, and I'd eat again, and, and I'd regret it. And then I'd try not to, and then I'd, and I, I'd eat again, and I would regret it. But every time I went in there, I was just like tempted. Do you understand? So what's the law of the mind? That's the problem here. I keep on giving in. There's always hope that I, my body says there's always hope you can get it. Because you haven't decided yet that you're not going to eat. And I was always hungry and I was always tempted and it was a struggle every time. And I, and I, I, kept, I kept regretting it until I finally came to the self. Okay, that's it. I don't care. I don't care if everybody eats. I just, it's, just, it's not healthy for me. I just, I just can't do it. So I'm just not going to eat. And when I finally came to the point where, there was, where I told myself, that's it. There's no hope. You know what happened to my temptation? It was gone. At least for me it was. The next time I went in there, I looked at the food and I wasn't even hungry. Because I, my body knew now that I finally said no. <laughs> And my wife, she asked me to fix supper for the kids. And it doesn't bother me. I'll go out and fix supper, and, I'll even, and I'm not tempted to eat in the least anymore. And so when I go over to people's homes or whatever, it's like they have a big meal, and I'll sit at the table because I just, I just don't eat, and it's just a personal thing, right? It's not everybody else, and I'm not condemning anybody else that eats suppers, right? <laughs> Nothing of that nature is just for me, right? And I find I'm, I'm healthier, at least I feel better on it. So, but I'll sit there and enjoy the conversation, won't eat, but I'm not tempted at all. <laughs> When I finally came to the point when I said, that's it. And my mind, it's a law of the mind that says, oh, can't get it, so let's be happy with something else. But until we come to that point, we have this continual desire for it because there's always that hope. And that is what the power of sin does in our life because it's through our desires that sin rules over us. Do you understand how the law of the mind can apply to our heart then? In our walk with the Lord? <laughs> now, um, I might call this law of the mind the law of, of surrender. And it really, has, it really probably has to do with this, this verse that we said, sang about uh, in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with open face beholding, as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, even as by the glory of the Lord. This is the text that tells us that phrase, by beholding we become changed, Right? By beholding, this is another law of the mind that you can actually apply to, right? That it's a, by beholding we become changed. It's a really a law of surrender. That when we surrender to Christ and we are watching him, when we have put aside the world and we are looking to Jesus, it becomes a law of the mind that he comes in and he will change us into his glory. Now the word for um, changed but we all with open face beholding, as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. The word change there is metamorpho. You all know that, don't you? You've studied biology. What is the word in English? Metamorphosis. But notice the meta. The word meta is the Greek prefix that means with. It means with in the active form, after with, and it looks toward the after effect, the change or the result that is only defined by the context. And then morpho is an image. And it's in this, this in one note that I found, it was rather interesting because it says it was changing the form, keeping the reality of the inner um, properly transformed after being with. <laughs> I don't know if you caught that. That the word metamorpho means to change into another image after being with, because meta is with. How are we changed? By being with him. Spending time with him. And it's a law of the mind. Being with him in those hours in the morning. That what you see, you start becoming. You spend time with him, and you're changed into his image. By beholding, we become changed. You know, our minds have limited capacity for focus. 
Do you know what we can focus on, usually? <laughs> we think we're good multitaskers, but we're not. Scientists say that we cannot multitask. Now, different areas of your brain can do different things at the same time. You can, you know, walk, and some of us can do this thing, you know, pat, <laughs> and do different things. I, I saw a video of a person who was balancing on a balance board, bouncing a ball. No, he was spinning a ball like this and spinning it, and he's repeating pi to, I forget, a thousand digits that he had memorized. And supposedly he was doing all of these at the same time, showing that you can multitask. Well, the fact of the matter is, different areas of his brain were doing each one of those things because they were becoming automatic, and it, was through, it wasn't through focal... Uh, you can repeat pi without thinking about it. Does that make sense? That the focus of the brain, scientists say, can only focus on one thing. Now, you can switch very rapidly between things, and you can think you're multitasking at the same time, but what you're doing is you're splitting your focus up into multiple areas, and so you're going tit, 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 and you're jumping back and forth, but the brain, the scientists think that you can only really focus on one thing at a time. And it's been illustrated in many ways. This story is, comes from the book Pain, The Gift That Nobody Wants by Dr. Paul Brand fascinating book. I haven't read the whole thing. My wife has read it. She's told me a lot about it. I've, I've looked at stories of it. The gift that nobody wants, pain. And this is World War II. He was a young intern in England at the early parts of the war, 1940. Started in 1939. And so by the spring, by May of 1940, Brand is a young intern medical student working in the wards in England and the war is going on on the mainland, but it's going poorly. As you know, the course of the war, the, 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 the Germans are pushing us back. And we are coming almost now to June of, of 1940, in which we are going to have Dunkirk. Famous battle, you probably heard of if you studied it. Dunkirk, in which there was this evacuation, right? And at that point, we basically left the mainland, and we're back in England, and France falls, right? So we are in May right now, and in the battle, in this case, it was called the Battle of Boulogne, if I pronounce it correctly, in France. It's right up here. Uh, France is down here, and um, the uh, Holland is up here, and Germany is pushing the Allied forces. Dunkirk is right there, and Boulogne is here. And this story comes from the Battle of Boulogne. And this is just a few days before the Battle of Dunkirk. And so the German forces are invading. And the Allied forces are there. And some of them are entrenched. And there is this, in this battle, um, right before this, let me back up a little bit, because right before this in England, the, a new discovery had taken place in the last year since 1939. It happened right at the same time as World War I. Anyone know what it was, medically speaking? Major transformation, transforming experience in medical history. It was penicillin. Antibiotics. And it was happening there in England, and they were, this man was doing research. He goes over the story of how, it, how he discovers penicillin and, uh, and then does research on it, discovers it can kill bacteria, and then he's trying to figure out how to in, in, inject it in people, and he's having all these problems. Well, right before the Battle of Boulogne, they, he figures out how to refine penicillin and inject it in people, and it actually works. And it was such a miracle drug <laughs> that men, soldiers, if they could just get a dose of it, it was like it was invin made them invincible <laughs> because they were dying a few moments before, and now it was curing them. It was an incredible breakthrough. And because these soldiers were coming in, you know, horribly conditioned. Now, it was, the trouble was, they didn't know really how to, per, per, they didn't know really how to, um, to purify it well, yet. And so the penicillin that they gave to the soldiers was this thick, yellowy goo. <laughs> and it was, it was a problematic because the penicillin, it was to if they injected it in your skin, it, it was so toxic at, at that spot that it would create necrosis. And if they injected it into your, into your vein, your, your, 
it would thrombosize, is that the word? It would, it would constrict and it would, it would stop the blood flow because it was, it was such a thing. And so the only way they could give it to a patient was to inject it sub, in, in the muscle, deep in the muscle. And so they inject, injected it in, 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 in the buttocks with a big needle and it burned. Patients would get so sore. And the worst part about it was you had to give it every three hours. Patients would get so sore that they would have to sleep on their stomachs because they couldn't sleep on their backs. So while it was the thing that was curing them, it was not a pleasant experience. Now, what happened is Jake was a soldier in the Battle of Belongay. And he became one of the heroes. He was fighting in the battles. And you can't really see it, but this, there's, in the, there's a harbor here that's right off the coast. And the Germans were coming in. The Allied ships were coming in here. And they were bombing the German places off of the ships. And then, but then they would start bombing the ships. And the, Allied, the ships would go back out to sea. They were ordered back in to try to evacuate soldiers. And some of those soldiers were taken uh, back to England. Jake was there and fighting. And he, uh, he was in a, in a foxhole. But the command was going to advance against the enemy. And he jumped out into no man's land and started going towards the enemy. Well, enemy fire quickly increased and he was trapped. He ducked down and he was stuck in no man's land, ducked underneath enemy fire. Presently, a mortar comes and lands on his legs. Artillery. His legs are mutilated, both of them. Somehow Jake manages to crawl across the ground to a foxhole where he could get relative safety. Meanwhile, he's now in there, and he looks at his legs, and they're just shredded. There is a buddy of his that jumps out and goes out again and goes down. Under enemy fire... He's out in no man's land a few yards away. Jake sees his buddy, and he knows his buddy's in trouble. He's going to die. Somehow, Jake drags himself and his legs through the mud and muck under enemy fire out of that foxhole across no man's land to his buddy. Then he drags his unconscious buddy through the mud and muck with his legs shredded back to the foxhole and they both survive. (laughs) Jake was a popular man. (laughs) His comrades were, they were amazed. They, this was, If anybody deserved penicillin, they had short supplies. They only gave it to some people. The comrade said, if anybody deserved penicillin, Jake deserves it. And so he goes to the hospital where Dr. Brand is, Jake is. And he's working there at the hospital, Dr. Brand is. And Jake is is there receiving his shots. Now, during the day, he, he, he receives his shots quite well. But you have to get them every three hours, remember? So during the day when there's other things going on, he'll get the shot and doesn't complain. But during the night, when the nurse had to come around her routines at 1 o'clock and then at 4 o'clock in the morning for his shots, he was so belligerent and so big and forceful that the nurse basically couldn't give the shot because he would scream and, and he was creating such an uproar up and the others. She finally asked Dr. Brand, Brand, Dr. Brand, can you, can you do something? I can't even give it to him in the middle of the night. And he was thinking, you know, wait a second, here's a man who has, I mean, dealt with pain. Why can't he take this shot? And so he finally says that he's going to go and talk to him and he's just going to be blunt and said, you know, Jake, you know, you're, you're this hero of, of Belonga. And I don't understand because we have this needle and 
this is for your benefit, and you're a tough guy. I mean, look what you did. Dr. Brandt had looked at the x-rays, and he had examined the legs, and he knew the millions of pain receptors that had been sent to his mind when he was in the battle because his legs were shredded. He knew it. And he said, I don't understand. How come you can't take this? You're a tough man. And Jake looked at Dr. Brand and said, Dr. Brand, you don't understand. When you're out on the battlefield and their bombs are blowing up and there's bullets flying by, you don't even feel the pain. But when you're laying in bed and there's a needle walking down the aisle, <laughs> the only thing you can think about is that needle. That needle. That needle! And he couldn't take it. <laughs> it was true. My son got poison ivy. And he said, Dad, why is it that poison ivy always itches so bad at night when I get in bed and in the morning when I wake up? All day long, it doesn't itch much. I told him this story. You know what makes the difference? You lay down in bed and you think, oh, I itch. And the more you think about that, the more you itch. <laughs> but during the day, there's lots going on. You don't think about it. And what happens? It doesn't itch because <laughs> your mind isn't focused on it. But what we focus on becomes the center of our attention to the exclusion of everything else. Right? And in the battle, he was focused on saving his buddy. And even though his legs were screaming out, I'm in pain and all this is going on, it was sending the same messages to the brain as the buttocks were. But one was focused on it, the other was focused on something else. Do you understand? It's a law of the mind that what you can focus on is, is, what, you, is what you become. <laughs> and this is a powerful thing of our focus. And, and it's, a, it's a law of our mind that we can experience when we can apply this to our Christianity. Now, this is the thing. I told you at the beginning, this doesn't have to do with salvation, but in, in, in many ways, it does. <laughs> because salvation comes when we finally do what? And I believe that this is a law of the mind that God created. That there is not this mis necessarily this mysterious miracle. Yes, it's a miracle that God uses when he changes our heart because we can't do that ourselves. But something has to happen in our life before he can change our heart. And what is it? It's the, it, close. A decision, someone said. It's when you, I told you it was the law of surrender, right? <laughs> because when the child surrenders that object, I want this object, I want this object, when they finally come to the point and they surrender and say, I can't have it, and they get happy with something else, right? That's the law of the mind, right? And so here's this other thing, this focus, where you are, are focused on one thing. Okay, so this is the thing. When we come to the point in our life that we say, Jesus, I surrender, and we really mean it, that's when conversion takes place. Because we give up on who we are, we give up on our own righteousness, our own trying to, get, to earn salvation, our own experience. We give up on it. We, I give up on me. <laughs> I've blown it. I really, I really can't do it without you. And we really surrender. And when we really surrender, God can suddenly change us. <laughs> and he can work in our heart. And he can do something with us in our lives. And that's really conversion. So I think that the law of the mind plays into conversion. But you can't convert yourself by the law of the mind but you can surrender. That's the law of the mind. But then he's going to do something because he created that law in you. And then he's going to change you and he'll start working in your heart and life and, and make you into something else because that's conversion. It's a change. It's a metamorphosis. It's a new creation in Christ. And so, yes, I think it is related. Um, I got ahead of me. That was one of those old ancient syringe, syringes that came down the aisle there. Uh, you can imagine, there's the yellow, thickish stuff in there, and it burns. You can imagine what it would be. But one thought, this one thought I want you to think about. When we really surrender, that's the law of the mind that changes our experience. When we really surrender. Now, there can be some other things that can be a good application to us. And I'm going to bring it home a little bit more. What do we have to do with these? And what, is your, what can be your experience towards them?
as long as there's hope that you don't have to wear it, you'll be miserable wearing it. It's a law of the mind. Does that make sense? But if you came to the point where you decide that this is what I should do and this is what I'm going to do and it's my choice and that's what I have to do, then suddenly your mind will say, oh, huh, it's a law of the mind. <laughs> and you'll be happy wearing it. Because that's the way God made us. But as long as there's this hope of, well, maybe I don't have to or, or I'm going to take it off now, and, 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 and we'll always be frustrated when we're wearing it because it's a law of the mind. Does that make sense? <laughs> it applies in so many areas of our life. But when we come to the point of surrender, God can do something because we actually are saying, okay, God, <laughs> I give up. I surrender my will to yours. And that's where he begins to work in our lives. And it can, it can be played out in so many different areas. You know, when you come to Washington Hills, there's a lot of things that are different. The students on the academy, they can't have one of these, you know. And that can be really frustrating and stressful. Can the law of the mind apply? You can be frustrated and angry that you don't have a cell phone all year long. Or you can be happy and content without it. What makes the difference? It's when we come to the point of surrender. <laughs> and we realize that, okay, I'm going to give it up. I can have it other times and not now. And it can come into all sorts of different areas. And I've seen it in so many experiences with students that throughout their experience, when it comes to, you know, every area of our life, uh, diet, and I've had that own, own experience. I remember when I first, and, and again, you know, it's not, I have my personal convictions on cheese, but that's, you know, personal convictions, and, and God will guide you and, and teach you in your own way, in your own time, I hope. But for me, I remember when I was giving up cheese. And I read the statement that says it's unfit for food, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, ooh, whew. And I was... I was a lacto-ovo vegetarian, but I sure like my lacto-ovo. <laughs> <laughs> and when I came to the point when I was giving it up, you know, I'd look at that again. It was that waffling kind of, I don't know, boy, and I would give in. And I was miserable because I wanted it so bad until I finally came to the point where I said, no, nope, that's it. I'm not going to do this. And suddenly I liked cashew cheese. I never liked it before until I made that final cut <laughs> in my life, essentially. And, and I've seen this in so many ways because it's a law of the mind that we can apply in so many areas of our life, but really it comes down to surrender. And our experience will be one of two things based on this idea of surrender. And what happens? We can apply it in so many different ways. When we take God's word, you know, we can say, we can study God's word. And, and one of the things you have to do is at Washington Hills, at least on the academy and the college are certainly encouraged to do it, is you have to get up at 545. Some students said, I've never seen a sunrise in my life. <laughs> Probably not true, but that's about the attitude. <laughs> and I have to get up at 545? That's still dark. Yeah, Jesus woke up a great while before dawn, the Bible says, right? <laughs> and he went out into a solitary place and prayed. A great while. Well, I don't know what time that was, but it was probably not 545 because that's only a few minutes before sunrise. <laughs> All right, so, um, but nonetheless, getting up at 545 is hard and, you, and it can be frustrating. It can, it can be like a chore, I think. I know. <laughs> Until there's this experience of surrender for it. God, I want something more. Now listen to this. This is a long quote, but I want you to see it. It says, all who are under the training of God need the quiet hour for communion with their own hearts, with nature, and with God. In them is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs, or its practices. And they need to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. What type of experience? This personal experience. And... At Washita Hills, there is this temptation because we're fed a lot of spiritual things. And you can kind of rest on the environment. Is that true? When you're here, you have a good experience. Then you go home, and you give in, and you get, and then you come back, and you get charged up again. You go home, and, you, and it's like, 
I better stay there because I can only be a Christian there. <laughs> right? And without a real personal experience, that will be our experience. It'll be this waffling back and forth. And it says, we need to have this personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is what? When you're on the battlefield, there's a lot of distractions. When you go home, there's a lot of distractions. Why do the academy students not have one of these? <laughs> it can be. It's a wonderful tool, but it can be a big distraction. And there's a lot of other things that are huge distractions can be, right? And those distractions are so loud that you can't hear the voice of God speaking to you, right? But when you're sitting in the ward and that nurse is coming down, the only thing you can hear is one thing coming, right? And so sometimes we need that experience of putting everything aside so that we can hear God's voice. Notice what it says. It says, when every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. Now that's what the experience we need in those morning hours when we actually can put away the distractions so that we can hear the voice of God speaking to us. And it is a law of the mind that what you focus on you will become and that when you decide that I'm going to do this because I, this is what, the only way I can get to know God is to spend time with him and I want to know him and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And when you really surrender, you'll find that your experience changes because it's a law of the mind. And then it says, he bids us be still and know that I'm God. This is effectual preparation for how much labor? College students, for all labor. This is the most important thing. It's this personal connection. It's this surrender to God. And amidst the hurrying throng, the strain of life's intense activities, he who is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. He will receive a new endowment of physical and mental strength. Ah, how many times I fail in my devotions of getting physical and mental strength, personal connection with a living creator who loves you and came here, died on a cross for you. He loved you that much. Can you connect with him? He loves you. He's waiting. And it's a law of the mind. When you surrender and you focus, you will. It can happen for you. It doesn't just have to be for the roommate. It someone else that, yeah, those are the godly people. Those are the good people. You should look at my messed up life. Jesus loves you too. He loves me. And by the way, we're all messed up lives. <laughs> we just think everybody else is worse, is better than us. <laughs> They're not. I'm not. <laughs> we're all in this boat of sin together. Although some sins are more sanctioned than others, you know. I can get angry, and that's kind of people just look the other way. But that's a sin. <laughs> but if you smoke or if you listen to some music or something, you know, <gasps> you know we are, we're all in this together. <laughs> Amidst the hurrying throng, it says, he will receive this new and mental. His life will breathe out a fragrance and it will reveal divine power that will reach men's heart. That's what we need. It's not our, <laughs> people aren't as concerned about our logic and our understanding of the 2300 days as they are concerned about our connection with God. And if we have it, somehow a fragrance will come out of us that will reach people's hearts. That's what I want this year. Is that what you want? <laughs> And I know I need it. I need a new experience. In Revelation, the Laodicean church had lost their first love. And Jesus offers them, buy of me gold, tried in the fire, white raiment. That's faith, by the way. Gold, white raiment, the righteousness of Christ that we need. And I salve, that we would see our spiritual condition and come to a Savior to receive covering because we don't know we're naked. We don't know we're blind. But he offers to cover us and to give us eyes to have to see. And that's what we can be, can be our experience and that's what I want this year. And by God's grace, the law is equally certain as is gravity. 
It can happen for you and me this year. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, thankful that our creator, God, made us with such laws, physical and spiritual, that govern this universe. It's not happenstance. Although the miraculous event of conversion can only come by your power, it can only come when we apply the law of the mind of surrender, giving up what we want, our desires, giving up on ourselves, saying, Lord, I can't do it. And I know that students have come here this year because they want a relationship with you. They've all said that. But yet there's many distractions in their own mind, in their own lives, bombs bombing all around them, and their <laughs> coronavirus <laughs> that is around this world. A lot of distractions, Father, and we need that focus on the thing that's most important so that we can find that quiet time, that personal living connection with you that others have found, that we can find too. And it's the only thing that will make us a laborer for you, and it's the only thing that will help us at the end of time, because when you come back, we're going to say, this is our God. We have waited for him. We have a personal connection with him. He's coming to take his children home, <laughs> that he's changed. And I pray, Father, that we might experience that this year that we would apply the law of the mind and recognize that when we struggle, it probably is an indication, or it often can be an indication, that we haven't surrendered yet. <laughs> we still have those desires and passions. Now, not always, they still flare back up. I'm still tempted now and then when I... But it's a rarer moment. The voice is getting quieter because you created us that way. And I pray that you might help each person here to experience the law of the mind this year, to apply it to their own hearts and lives and see the result that comes when they put your laws into practice. But most importantly, Father, that we would surrender and that you would change our heart because of that and we would truly experience salvation by faith in Christ is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Wachita Hills Academy and College for our weekend program. We sincerely hope that you have been blessed by this program. Uh, to continue to spread this good news, you can go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Make sure to click that little notification bell so you know when we upload our next video. You can also check us out on Facebook and Instagram, and the links to those will be in the description. Thank you so much again for joining us today, and we hope that you have a blessed Sabbath.